Good evening, everybody. My name is Stacy Catron, and I have the great honor of serving as the Cherokee Garden Library Director here at the Atlanta History Center. And I'm so glad you could all be here tonight with us. As we wait for people to continue to join our program this evening, please add your questions for Thomas Piper in the Q&A box. I know we're gonna get dozens and dozens of questions. So just a, a kind reminder to keep your questions as brief as you are able to do so. Looks like we've got more signing in, but we are at five past, so we're gonna get started. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the library, it was founded by the Cherokee Garden Club of Atlanta in 1975 and is named for our Georgia state floral emblem, the Cherokee Rose. The Cherokee Garden Library is one of the special collection libraries of the Keenan Research Center here at the Atlanta History Center. The library collects and preserves works in a variety of subjects related to gardening, horticulture, landscape design, and ecology. Ranging in date from 1586 to the present, the Garden Library's collections tell the myriad stories of horticultural and botanical histories in the southeastern United States and the global influences on our landscapes. The library has a symbiotic relationship with the History Center's amazing Gazueta Gardens, a remarkable 33-acre green space that contains nine distinct ecologically beneficial and educational gardens. I invite you to learn more about these treasures of the Atlanta History Center via our website and in person with appropriate protocols in place to keep us all safe. I wish to thank the Georgia Perennial Plant Association for sponsoring this program with Thomas Piper this evening and partnering with the Cherokee Garden Library of the Atlanta History Center to share this opportunity with the public. Before I introduce our speaker with our conversation, I thought it would be fun for us to rewatch the trailer to Five Seasons, The Gardens of Pete Aldoff. So my colleague's gonna cue that up now. When Pete, he works in this very, very intuitive way. He plants, as an artist, paints. All the excitement and the dynamism and the seasonal change of natural environments, but in a way that, above all, it kind of emotionally speaks to people. This is a meadow of uh, one and a half acre. The garden is meant to get lost in, so it's quite big. Beauty is in so many things you wouldn't think of. And I think this sort of struggle about beauty and no beauty, I think that's part of my life too, you know. What I try to create with gardens is, of course, beauty, but the moment you say that I love plants that are dead, then you have a problem because people don't like dead plants. I think it's the journey in your life to find out what real beauty is, of course, and but also discover beauty in things that are, uh, on the first sight, not beautiful. I'm so excited to welcome Tom Piper this evening to be with us to have a conversation about his amazing film. Um, for those of you who haven't read um, Tom's bio yet, here's just a little brief overview. Um, he's an award-winning nonfiction filmmaker specializing in documenting contemporary artists. He has directed, photographed, and or edited more than 25 films on painters, sculptors, photographers, architects, 
designers and writers, and of course, the garden designers as well. As an independent producer, he has worked with clients including the Guggenheim Museum, Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Garden Museum in London, and the Nature Conservancy, just to name a few. His films have played theatrically, been broadcast on public television in North America and abroad, and exhibited at festivals and museums worldwide. So of course, we're very, very excited to have him here this evening to discuss his film Five Seasons. And before we dive into this conversation, I want to make a connection to the Atlanta History Center and some of what we're going to be talking about tonight. I want to note that the most recent garden addition here in Gazueta Gardens is our new entrance gardens. And this is the first curated garden space that all our visitors see when they first come to the History Center. And I must mention this because those visitors are being welcomed to our site with a garden designed in the new perennial movement style and inspired by the work of Pete Outoff. So right here on our own campus. So for y'all, everyone in the Atlanta area that hasn't been by recently, please come see these gardens. Tom, welcome and first and foremost, congratulations on your film. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stacy, um, And thanks to everybody who's helped organize this. Um, and. Uh, and, and bring the film. I mean, these virtual events have sort of felt like they've really filled a void and it's nice to see that they keep happening and the film keeps having uh, a relevance or finding an audience. I've read so much about your film and I've watched it several times and many have called your film mesmerizing, meditative, immersive, and it takes us through the seasons and the extraordinary art is what I really think about of, of Pete that he creates through his garden designs and his deep passion for plants. So I was thinking a lot about it early this morning. And to me, your film is also delicate, complex, insightful, and powerful. I mean, how often do you watch a documentary and the hair stands up on your arm? And so I'm just so delighted you were here. And we're going to um, dive into the Q&A box. I promise not to dominate with all my own questions for everyone out there for, in virtual land. Um, but I wanted to start off with a few questions I had, which I think many in our audience will want to know. Um, I have to know, when was the first time you met Pete and what drew you to document his work as an artist? Right. Um, it, it, so I'd been making films about uh, I mean, originally most of the subjects were artists, but then it became architecture, was sort of an alley that I, I got into. Um, and, and then I happened to have worked on a film about the, the design architects for the Highline, uh, a firm called Diller, Scafidio and Renfro. And, um, and they, you know, that, it just meant I got to spend a lot of time on the Highline and, and then, um, you know, it was through that project. I mean, I never had a chance to meet Pete or talk to him while I was making that film, but it was definitely through that project that then, you know, introductions were made and, and I had a chance to, to finally get to meet him um, when he was in New York visiting. I mean, he comes back regularly to sort of meet with the gardeners on the High Line and to, um, to sort of continue to be involved in the ongoing maintenance and editing and, you know, the the way that garden evolves um, or that project evolves. And so, so we met and, um, and it was just, you know, I, don't, it was, it, I didn't really have anything specific in, in mind other than I, I knew that I was really fascinated by his work and, and, and curious to sort of understand it more. I mean, I, I always feel like right off the bat, I, I come clean that I'm not a gardener or, you know, I hadn't been a gardener um, before making this film for sure. And, um, and really didn't know much about garden design. Um, and so to me, it was like my, you know, my fascination with his work was more trying to understand it almost from the context of like I would understand or try to understand art or, or the way I respond to art. I mean, in the same way that there's this kind of mysterious attraction or, or engagement that you have with a work of art, you know, that's kind of how I felt when I was seeing Pete's work um, I had also visited his garden in um, in Chicago, the Lurie Garden, 
and definitely had the same experience there, really powerfully had the same experience there where before, and I didn't even know him by name at that point. I mean, I happened to be working on another architecture project and happened to go down into the garden to shoot the building from afar that I was making the film about. And, you know, I had this really kind of transfixed engagement, got really distracted by the garden. And, you know, I just, I just was, I just felt like that was interesting that, that a, a, a natural space, a, a landscaped space could do that. And, and I just wanted to try and figure out what, what was going on. Um, but, and then as I started to learn more about him specifically in, in garden design in general, it, it just sound, it just felt like there was something really interesting. And, and then the thrill of being able to spend a lot of time in all of these incredibly beautiful spaces was, was certainly sealed the deal in terms of making it feel like it would be a good project to pursue. Well, I think obviously it was a great project to pursue uh, based on your, your film. Um, I really love the opening of your film, um, watching Pete draw his garden designs and, and hearing the movement of the pens across the page. And it made me think a lot about my first lit professor saying, you know, the first sentence in your short story, your novel, or in your case, the opening scene to your film is so important because that's how you're meeting your audience for the very first moment. So I was thinking I wanted to ask you, how did you decide to lead with that scene? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think when that kind of, when, when I got that material. I mean, the, the shooting of the project was interesting because I, I, I started Originally, so when we first met him, we'd sort of agreed that it might be interesting to try and do something together. Um, and he sort of submitted to the idea of being documented in some way. But but at that point, I really thought it would be interesting to focus on his garden um, and and maybe just do a, a short piece about that garden and, and just what that means to him and, 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 and use that as a way to understand his work. And, um, and so, you know, initially I wasn't really thinking beyond that or, or but then as, as, as he sort of revealed himself to be a really interesting character and, and he also turned out to be a really great partner in the film and that he kept thinking of things that he thought might be interesting to shoot. And so he was sort of bringing me along as much as I was trying to follow him. So it was really a, a two way street maybe. And, um, and so it, it went from being a, uh, sort of a limited focus, maybe I'll visit his garden a handful of times to then becoming a much bigger project and much more involved in the shooting. And so it's, it's hard to remember when exactly I, I, I sort of spent a lot of time with him in the studio while he was working. And he was pretty reluctant at the outset to like let that be filmed. Um, you know, it's, I think there were various reasons for that, but in general, it's like, you know, that's his intimate moment of creating something. And so, you know, to have me standing over his shoulder was not probably the most comfortable thing, but, um, but I, I did love, I mean, we, we talked about it a few times because he usually almost, I probably always works with music playing in the background and he has a really very taste in music. And so it, it was, it was not ever that quiet and it, it, there was, and I kept shooting it with the music and thinking, oh, this would be interesting to reveal something about him and his taste. But then there was one, I remember one time just thinking like, let's just, can we just turn the music off and I'm just going to shoot it with you working in silence, which I think he thought was weird and unnatural, but it meant then that I could really get the sound. And, you know, the, that part I love is just the sound of the, of the, those pens on the, on the paper. Um, you know, that became really a nice way to set up that hopefully the rest of the film was going to be very focused on the sounds as much as the images. Yeah, I, I think you succeeded so much and what a great opening. Um, after that, we find ourselves in the grocery market with Pete and you, right? Yeah. So I got so tickled because the man helping him, I think he was selecting brie or something. And um, so the man behind the counter sees you with your camera and goes, is he following you? Yeah. And then Pete responds, I'm leading him. And I thought that sort of resonates throughout the film. I was thinking of this interplay, your collaboration, you know, that kind of ebbed and flowed and what you brought to him as an artist and what he brought to you as an artist. And so I wanted to ask, what was your 
sort of favorite part of the collaboration with Pete? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that idea, I mean, that was a kind of a set up a little bit, that idea of, um, no, I'm leading him, I sort of goaded him. Anyhow, that was, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it does reveal something of the the nature of the interaction. And, and as I was saying before, he was really good about um, thinking of interesting things to shoot. But, um, so, it, you know, well, for me, it was unusual because most subjects are, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a very, it's a very invasive process to be filming people and, and very unnatural. And, and you know, it's, it, everyone knows now, of course, because everybody's got a camera in their pocket, but it's really uncomfortable to have it pointed at you and to be observed. And so most subjects, right, are just trying to avoid that or just minimize it but but he was really as a filmmaker you often are kind of like worried what you're missing or, or chasing after the subject you know calling all the time like is there anything interesting happening and thinking you know what am I missing um and he was sort of the opposite of me he just would you know he would call up and say I'm going to Pennsylvania with my friend Rick Dark and you know you should come it'll be great and uh, or I'm going to Texas and we're going to drive around the we went to visit you know they went the trips these trips would often be quite long and i would just kind of show up for a few days that could work in my schedule but um you know so that was really unusual and and that's what made it into a much bigger project than just kind of a profile of a garden or a profile of a designer um and, and I, I think that's you know the film is better for it of course you know um i was thinking also about Pete's photography of plants, so stunning and intimate. And I've, we have all his books here at the Cherokee Garden Library and I've looked, gored over them so many times. So I was curious as how his photography influenced your cinematography and, and yeah. sort of your lens, those many lenses I'm sure that you look through as you think about a project. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd never really uh, shot landscape before gardens or, or even just you know, non-built spaces. And so it was really, I mean, it was really exciting because it's a beautiful space, place to be to figure these things out. But I really did feel like I didn't quite know how to go about it um, at the outset. And, but certainly even in that first meeting I had with him, he had his iPad, uh, you know, as he does, and he just was rifling through photographs, you know, hundreds of them as we just sat and chatted. And so, um, that that helped me and what was nice is I think I realized like I understood how he sees a garden or or he always resists but we always get in an argument typically when I say this because he says it's not true but I, I feel like it's maybe less about how he sees a garden in terms of the making of the garden but it, it's certainly how he photographs and thinks about like what interests him and this would be true even when we would go to places like it, the wildflowers in in Texas or the the woods in Pennsylvania that um, you know are, are wild landscapes. He, he uh, you know it, it's all the compositions are very internal and it's not about the sky and the horizon and the wider view. It's very composed for the for the density and the abstract things that are happening within the way plants interact. And and I think that's true of his gardens. And it was really like that. So many of his photographs are like that. And that sort of gave me an indication both of how he sees it but how I could shoot it to to capture what he's doing um so that was a big it was a great place to start for sure so we mentioned it we touched on it very briefly earlier but the music in five seasons to me is just outstanding and um this sort of soundscape you know just helps fill this picture and so beautifully I think through the whole journey and I have to ask, how did you find these composers, particularly the piano composer, because I'm obsessed, and how all that came about? And then you have to also let us know how we can get the soundtrack. Right. Well, um, yeah, no, I, I love the music as well. It's just one of those things that really fell into place. And, and you never quite know. I mean, typically, I'm also working on projects where there's no expectation that it will be scored by a composer you know it's, it's the budgets don't often allow for that uh, or, or time sometimes even gets in the way and um but this was just one of those things where 
and it and it's it feels like such an impossible task at the outset because the you know you, you sort of think well I'll ask Pete what music he likes but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what might be good for the images of the film and you know it's just a you really it's you're kind of flying blind at the outset or or you know the choices are essentially infinite and um but it was I was so the, the project at Hauser and Worth, which became the kind of spine for the film, you know, the one project you, we sort of see from paper to to being planted um, and, and, and a, as a realized garden. You know, and that was so serendipitous for so many reasons. I mean, it's it's Pete. I still think Pete still thinks I think that it's one of his best gardens. So that was perfect. And um, the fact that they are an art dealer first you know it's not a it's not a garden it's not a place known for its gardens it wasn't something they were you know that wasn't typically going to be the focus of this place that they were an amazing place that they were building um and of course now it turns out to be the big draw and everything else sort of responds to the the garden um but it was also uh it was also just like this really interesting mix of people because it's a, a really incredible um, gallery with an incredible roster of artists and and the artists who were in residence there while I was shooting and I, I would I visited probably four times over the course of a year and a half um, but it's this uh, they're now based in Iceland but it's a Swiss artist Dieter Roth and and it's the Dieter Roth studio he's no longer alive but it's his son and grandson who are both artists as well and they still keep the studio going and and they um they're just characters like total characters and they were in town and had taken over they they, they sort of had this crew of 10 or 15 you know artists and crafts people with them and and they'd all moved into another building in this small town of Bruton um but I remember just one night talking to Oder Roth, who's the grandson, and saying, you know, I, I think I was actually asking him specifically because I I had had sort of what we call like temp tracks, scratch tracks, like just music you lay in because you like how it's working, or maybe that's the right idea, and you use that to see where else you can go. And and I'd had a song from an Icelandic band that I was using in one scene, and, and I, so I think I just asked him, knowing he was from Iceland, oh, do you happen to know these guys? And you know, could you make, is it possible, do you think I could get the rights to use the music? And and he immediately said, that's, you don't, that's not who you want to get involved with. And he's like, I know the guy who's going to be perfect. And I was like, great, you know, that's fantastic. And it turned out to be someone who was part of the crew there. And, um, and you know, he was, they're all like, I mean, I don't, don't want to overplay it, but they're pretty crazy and real rabble rousers and troublemakers in a lot of ways. And anyhow, so he was like, this is the guy. And it, it, he turned out to be the, 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 the pianist, the, you know, who did most of the first half. I mean, it kind of blends, but it's essentially the first half of the soundtrack is all his music. And, and he was fantastic, you know, just was such a stroke of luck and, um, but also really difficult to get, you know, it wasn't like he was going to score the film. He basically was like, here's a stack of music and use what you want. And that was, you know, the communication with him was not always <laughs> direct or frequent, but it just meant that I had some genius stuff to work with. And then the, the rest of the soundtrack actually came, once I realized I wasn't going to get any more from this guy, um, I turned to a friend of mine here in Brooklyn and, um, and just asked him if he would work on it. And he sort of was able to sort of work from that initial music and then come up with all this other stuff that, you know, I think what was great is the way it really fleshed out and became like the sound of a band and multiple instruments. And, um, but it was really fun to work on. And really, it just, I think that came together really nicely. So yeah, so a soundtrack album, I would love to make happen. I don't know. Well, yeah, put that on your list. So let's yeah. make that happen. I'm sure there are lots. Does mean I'll have oh, to go I back to, to to David and say like, can I get the rights to like release this album? I mean, it does open up that can of worms again. But um. yeah, absolutely. So for many of us, you know, Pete's work has enthralled us for years, um, generally because of his intense focus on plants and how he works with them, like a palette, like you know, he's an artist. Um, but for me, 
something that resonates with me and art that I'm generally drawn to across the board in every medium is finding beauty in what a lot of people don't. And so that quote where he says, at times I think there are too many flowers and I long for decay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm just really Southern and Faulkner-esque and that just works for me, but I just love that. And I want to know how you connected with him in that way and also in your own art, because I think that really speaks to you and it's a theme you carry, a recognition of it throughout this film anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, I know that one of the things that I liked right away or, or made me more curious about his work was as I learned about, in particular, this idea of using, um, designing with the kind of fall and winter in mind and, and the way it was about the, um, the structures of the plants and the, and the seed heads and the stalks and, and you know, that, that, and then, you know, it's, it's easy, I think, to look at those and think about them as, as drawings or as abstract compositions. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I certainly, it's like a, a thing that I'm drawn to as well. Just this idea of it's be, it's like, you know, creating something, making you think twice about, a medium or a material or just an image that that you wouldn't find beautiful otherwise and that the artist has done something to to create and draw you and open up the possibility for it to be beautiful and you know not as pete says like not everybody loves the idea of dead plants and not everybody thinks what i'm doing is beautiful but it's just that you know the, the way in which he um opened up that possibility and, and not singularly or alone or, you know, he's not the only person to do it, but obviously he's doing it in a way that makes that accessible and attractive. And, and um, you know, I, I just find that so fascinating, the way we as humans are capable of that, that, um, you know, that was certainly the, the real thing I was after. Um, initially and then it was about trying to learn and under appreciate everything that's going on in the garden but yeah I mean when he, he when he in the summer I mean it's it, it was there was lots of things going on but I think in that in the summer scene you know he even in the shooting of that visit to his garden um you know I think he was probably also that was the last time we shot together in home alone I think he was probably Maybe he was just in a bad mood that day. Maybe he was just tired of the project in general or was, didn't want to keep talking on camera. But, but undoubtedly, there's a portion of that that's also him being genuine about like, you know, summer's not really the point to him. And, and, and in a way, it's like, it's almost, he just wants to move on from that. And um, so I, I, yeah, I, have, I just, I love that whatever was happening to him that day, it gave the whole impression that he was like enough of this floral abundance you know <laughs> so I think that really um that worked really well um and uh yeah and just sets up that that whole notion that he's that's not what he's after particularly so I'm gonna step away from my questions because I have many more and I don't want to be selfish so I'm going to jump into our Q&A box because we have a big audience out here and um ask some of their questions um, this is a good question. Um, one of our attendees says, I love the music um, you chose to accompany the film. Were you or Pete influenced by Vivaldi and the beauty of each of his four seasons? I can say um, not consciously, but only through my own lack of um, being able to make that connection in the moment. Um, but I think it's great. I mean, you know, there's any number of sort of ways in which the the seasonal thing is is present in so many different art forms and so many different um you know the suites of poems that are all based on the seasons and and so that was um i think i i, I sort of thought well this is going to be a great structure um because of just the basic elements of our living on the planet but um but i didn't think specifically about Vivaldi. I'd have to ask um, uh, David, the you know the Icelandic pianist. I wonder if yeah, he, yeah. you know, what he thinks of Vivaldi. But you know, that would be interesting. Would. So another interesting question. Um, this attendee says, "You have seen Aldolf's gardens in the United Kingdom and here in the U.S. and obviously um, in Holland. 
Is there a comparison to be made between these gardens, especially during the winter when the climate in the UK can make these perennials look like a sodden mess? <laughs> Whereas here in the States, the dying perennials stand out better due to bright winter days. Um, yeah, it's interesting uh, to think about the different contexts for these gardens, um, just in general. and and. And, you know, but I also think about his garden in Humalo in Holland and, and how much that is, you know, a, a very similar climate to the UK in some respects. But, but it's also what, what, it, what I thought was amazing, what I came to, one of the things I came to appreciate and, and really love um, was the way in which, um, and this would be true of any garden, any naturally living thing that every day is a different day. And so there's a change, there's something different happening um, every day. And, but the way Pete, you know, he, when he's home, he wakes up every morning and goes out in the garden and takes pictures or just walks around. Like there's something he is looking to enjoy no matter the time of year or the circumstance or the weather or, or any of those things. And so I think there's, there's something about that idea that even, um, even a sodden mess, you know, can, can contain something beautiful and, and, or, or just be engaging. And so, yeah, maybe there is something about um, not, not having that frequent uh, uh, context for the winter plants in the U.S. versus the U.K., but uh, I do think it's, um, it's just one day to the next, you know, some days are beautiful and bright and sunny and the others... I mean, one, one funny thing that happened when I was shooting in, in, in into his garden in particular in Holland, but you know, I, I was, I made, I think I made eight visits to Homolo over the course of two years. And, um, and on the last time visiting, I, I realized I had never, it had never rained while I was shooting. Like it had just never happened, which in the moment felt like this incredibly good fortune that I got great weather every time. But it also just felt like completely false that I had no, no evidence that of the climate that probably is predominant in certainly in the winter in Holland, right? It's always gray and rainy. And so, so then I had to actually ask Pete, I was like, anytime it rains, can you just go out and take some footage with your camera and send it to me? Just, I just wanted, I just need something. And so that, that, that whole, there's that little scene in the movie where it's just about the garden in the rain and it's not winter, it's actually spring or it's kind of late, early summer, but but yeah, that was all just, he has shot that. And I just was really like, you know, that that's going to be so, um, such a relief, I feel like at some point to have that um, change of weather. But, um, but that's also, I think, true to the way in which, you know, you, the garden can be interesting because it changes all the time. So here's another interesting question. How did Pete make the great leap from interest in plants to his greenhouse lab experiments, his nursery? to painting with plants with a consummate hand. Yeah. Um, I, it's a probably, I don't know. I, I don't know enough to be authoritative about um, the pantheon of designers and how they all became designers and, and everything. But it does feel a little unique. I mean, certainly I love the stories of Pete taking a long time to find his creative outlet, you know, that, that he was late to it in some sense. Um, and, uh, but, but I think that idea, the, the thing that I also would hear over and over from other like plants people, like people who really know what Pete's doing on a botanical level or, or horticultural level, but the thing they would all say um, is that he, you know, he just knows more. He has more in his head about, he's more, knowledge plant knowledge than anybody else and that so that in many ways a lot of what he's able to do or is doing is just the result of that like he just knows the medium so intimately I mean, it's james corner in the films you know makes this reference to a chef and the, your ingredients or you know you know i can't remember now the other ones he used but it, it, i think it's like that it's just that he in fact, that whole long period of just being a nurseryman, essentially, I mean, he did say that he was doing design projects as he could, but basically he's running a nursery, but that that is the building block to then being able to make 
gardens and do things with plants that maybe other people hadn't thought of or couldn't imagine because he just, he was so intimately knowledgeable from having worked in that very fundamental way of just growing plants, you know, and, and just paying attention to how they grow. And, well, you touched on this next person's question slightly um, many, many minutes ago. Um, how did making this film inform your personal relationship with gardens and other design natural spaces around you? You talk about being the Lurie garden and sort of having this yeah. like magical moment, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that really was the first, like the first time I ever went to one of Pete's gardens was that garden. It was even before the High Line um, was ready. And so, that was kind of like the seminal moment for me in terms of connecting to Pete's gardens and work. Um, but, but I think, you know, I mean, I'm much more conversant about plant names and species and stuff. And I, you know, I certainly have a much better appreciation for the history of garden design and where Pete fits into that and, um, and where his work sits with other trends in garden design or, or traditions of garden design. Um, but I, I also think it's, um, you know, I just, I pay more attention and I, and, I, and I look at things differently. I mean, this is true of, you know, in, in the best sense, this is probably the greatest thing I get from any of the films I get to work on is like, I, it, you know, I learned to see a little bit differently because someone else has shown me how they see things. And, um, and because the subjects are artists, it's, you know, they tend to have a very interesting way of looking at things. And so it's, an, it's, um, it's a particularly advantageous way to learn to see things. But yeah, that's, I think the best thing I've gotten from it is that, um, I mean, I still have no significant outdoor space, so I don't have any garden of my own. And I haven't, I haven't technically become a gardener, but in many ways, you know, like to, to appreciate gardens is that, that I've, I've gained for sure. So um, another attendee asked, why five seasons? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I probably started originally with the idea that it was like just going to be a little bit odd to have it be about five seasons and four, but also then it, it felt nice to have, um, again, about that scene in the summer where it feels like that's, it's not like this, it doesn't build to a triumph and it's, you know, late August and everything is glorious and in bloom. It's, you know, I think for Pete, it's like getting back to fall is essential and, and that, so it was nice to have this sort of coda of making, of starting in fall and say, instead of starting in winter or spring and then ending again with fall so that it was, it was, um, completing that cycle that for him, I think is almost how he measures a garden, you know, um, and, and the life cycle of a garden. And, and then it was nice actually that it was um, Adrian Higgins, who's the garden writer for the Washington Post. And uh, he, he I, I, there was a screening in DC and he came and then he wanted to interview me and did a, you know, was asking me a few questions to write a little piece about the film. And, uh, he asked the same thing. He was like, why, why five seasons? But then he said, you know, oh, were you thinking of the fifth season? And I, you know, I was like, no, there are four seasons as far as I'm aware. And he said, um, he said, no, no, you know, like gardeners, especially, we always think about this fifth season that is this, you know, maybe it's like Indian summerish. I'm not sure, but it, you know, like there's some period of time that is after summer and the kind of last hurrah of the garden or, or, you know, maybe there are other things that you're doing as a gardener in the earth at that point. But so then I was like, oh, that's great. I love the idea that it, it actually has a, there is a fifth season somewhere and that it could have that kind of resonance as well. Um, so I, yeah, it, it just became a kind of, I mean, I will say originally, I just wanted the title to be the names of the seasons and, um, and the distributor when, when he became interested in the film, he was like, no it's not going to work like people are not going to go see a movie that they have to say the names of the season so anyhow that's when it became five seasons actually it was when it was going into distribution so so another question who originally brought the two of you to work together on this project i believe it might have been the architect of the high line but i don't know who specifically yeah and no and it was really i mean this is probably the one project that was um i mean there are lots of people who uh 
brought me, I mean, like my, I have a friend who's the director of the Garden Museum in, in London, and he was actually the one who made the initial introduction to Pete. And, uh, and um, you know, my wife was like, oh, you, you should really do something about Pete. I mean, there were lots of people who were helping point me in the right direction for sure. But, um, but it, it was, it, it's this project in particular is the first where I was really like, you know, just thinking what, if I could do anything, what could I do? And then that seemed to be the most interesting project I could come up with. So in many ways, it was a real, for good and bad, it was really an independent endeavor. Um, you know, wasn't commissioned by anybody, wasn't um, for anyone else. I like that about it, actually. Yeah. I mean, I mean it gave yeah. you and Pete, I mean, more collaboration than with the musicians that came in to the picture and a lot of freedom. Yeah, yeah, it really did ultimately feel like you know, this could go any way I want it to. Um, which, there were moments where that was not a good thing, but you know, right. at the end of the day, it was nice to meet the challenge. Oh, wow, this question is completely different. Um, it appears you set up time-lapse clips to capture the seasons. Did you spend a lot of time during the year to be able to shoot those? Yes, so that um, maybe in, in, in inverse to the music experience the, the time lapse thing was like a, it was it was like the windmill you know Don Quixote or something I mean it was such a totally I really had this idea from the beginning I was like oh man this is going to be incredible like the way to show what happens in Pete's Gardens I'm going to take these time lapses from like a year or two years or just as long as I can make them and but I really didn't know anything about how to do that and um so I started researching it and, you know, you can, um, and this was, you know, now almost nine, eight, nine years ago. So technology, of course, as usual, has made that, that whole notion cheaper and easier to do. But when I was trying to figure it out, like there were opportunities to, there were these specialized companies that you could hire um, and they would set up time long-term time-lapse cameras and then you could get the images off the internet and and they do this mostly for like construction companies or or, or big building projects and um but you know because that was their typical client it costs like a fortune and i just there was no way i could afford that and so um or you know at best i was going to be able to like maybe set up one of those in one place but then i was like it'd be great to just like show every, you know, have all, I just thought the more the merrier in terms of this really ambitious plan. And, and so then I just started building these boxes by myself based on, you know, little bits and pieces. And it was like GoPro cameras and solar panels. And, you know, it all seemed like this could be great. And it was such a little hobbyist project. And, and then I started setting them up. And, and I, I, at, at one point they were there were probably six different camera boxes set up in different gardens, all, all you know, Chicago for sure, the Somerset, the UK, Pete's Garden, I had two of them. Um, and then from like the word go, they worked horribly, just like they, the solar panels kept not producing enough power or, and then at some point I realized like the solar panel, or they would get covered in bird droppings. So then they no longer could get sunlight and, um, it just was in such a misadventure and I would constantly be, and I couldn't check. I mean, it was nice. This person was like, could I, you know, like I, I, the fantasy of being able to just sit like in a bird box and just stay for a year watching the garden grow, I actually would love, but in, in reality, I would go once every couple of three months, four months to check on most of these places. And so, um, and I would show up and it would work for like two weeks and then be dead. And so every time I'm like, this is never gonna amount to anything. I can't believe what a disaster it is. And, and I just kind of kept them going as best I could like limping along um, and just thought, well, you know, I, that, was, that was an idea and it didn't come off. And it was only in the editing that I started thinking like, oh, the, you know, maybe I'll look at those images or, and then, it, sort of led to this idea that it was actually more interesting to see them, um, you know, like a typical time lapse is very frenetic and everything's look, you know, it's, it just looks like high speed stuff happening, you know, like you've seen those ones with like the high, cars on the highway just streaming by and, and they can be really beautiful and mesmerizing, but there's an energy to them um, that is, is fast paced. And I just thought, well, that's not what I was looking for anyways. And then I realized like, oh, I could, 
and I, I started working actually with these really amazing graphic designers in um, based in um, Lithuania. But I, I started thinking, well, if I just took an image from February and one from March and one from April and one from May and June, and, and then just let them somehow evolve into each other and, and kind of artificially create the, the interstitial moments. Um, and then, and then it just like had this really slow, methodical pace. And, and then because I could find like in one location, I had enough to stitch together the winter to spring transition or in another location, I ju had just enough to get from summer to fall. And, you know, so then I could, I, I just ended up being able to barely piece it together. But I think then they became these quite nice elements of the film that, um, that were, you know, ended up being feeling really triumphant that I could make something of them and, and that it, it paid off in the end. So that was nice. So another interesting question. Um, this virtual audience member says, um, I have a book, Gardens of the High Line by Pete Aldoff and Rick Dark, who specializes in grasses. How much did Pete's incorporation of native plants and grasses into the naturalized habitat play a role in creating the film? These choices reintroduce the important relationship of insects and wildlife and plant selection that seem to become an integral part of the film intro like the spider webs. Um, this individual loves the dried seed pods of the swamp mallow, I do too, on the pond in contrast to their hibiscus wide open blooms of summer. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's a huge part of, of Pete's gardens. Um, and it was really interesting to learn. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the kind of one of the evolutions in Pete's design. And the one thing I was able to kind of retrace was the way in which he, when he was working on the Lurie garden, went to visit these um, re restored prairie, regenerated prairies, um, Midwestern prairies that are just outside of Chicago um, in Illinois. And, uh, and he, you know, and that's, um, uh, Roy Diblick is the one he worked with there and who took him to these places. And Roy is the one who had the nursery that was just growing only native plants. And, you know, he's the one in the film who says like, no, one, I couldn't sell these plants for love or money. And then all of a sudden Pete does the Lurie garden. And now I, you know, now I, what I do is valid. And, um, and, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I think like that was all about trying to, as Pete says, like recreate this native habitat but, but I think what Pete does and what makes it so interesting is that, you know, he's doing it to really exaggerate the emotion that he has when he's in those spaces. And so it's, it's like this, you know, it's a totally artificial landscape and it's an artificial recreation of his kind of fantasized idea of a, of a prairie garden or a prairie and, and turned into this prairie garden. Um, but it, you know, I think it's, to me, what's interesting is that it's not a, it's not a principled dogmatic approach to it. And, and in many ways, I mean, I think being attracted to artists and, and as subjects, it's that, that's kind of what you get, you know, that the, 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 the creativity comes first and foremost, and that it's true that Pete's work is really, you, you know, is celebrated because of this use of native plants and has done so much to promote um, native plants. Um, but at the same time, then it's, he's also all about using North American natives in European gardens or English gardens. And so there's, um, you know, then it's, it's a whole different idea of native plants, because they're not native to where he's using them in Holland, for instance. Um, and, but at the same time, it's a kind of, there, I, I love there's a certain ambiguity about, or ambivalence about this as well, that, that, you know, like, I think, people can see that in his work and celebrate it for that. But for Pete, it's at the end of the day for Pete, it's just about creating something that moves him, you know? And then what follows from that is kind of, that's for everybody else to respond to. Um, so I think, in, it, you know, I always find that interesting. And I, I think it's, um, it's great when it's like, you can see all these different things in it, but that's not the motivation for the, the creation of it. You know, the creativity that lies behind it is its own elemental thing. Another viewer asked, 
says, I'm a painter with a studio overlooking my backyard that I've planted as a focal point for my work, although it's mostly abstract. Does Aldolf ever paint from his own gardens once the designs have evolved? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain Pete has never painted his gardens. I don't, I can't, I don't have any, he never let on that he'd ever, like for him, I think the camera is like, that's his tool for, you know. Um, and like I said, I mean, his, the photographs he takes, tends to take are really beautiful and abstract in their own way and, and, um, and painterly like his gardens. But, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I never see, like even his drawing is very limited to the, you know, like I've never seen him sketch uh, a garden or, you know, a, a non-planned view of a garden. Um, that's interesting, maybe I'll ask him that. So this viewer says that some of us on the call um, may have not seen the film yet. Um, could you give a short overview of his career and his background, his nationality? Yeah, sure. I mean, he um, is, you know, as the, the cliche, I think, or whatever the common refrain now is he's, you know, he's the rock star of the garden design world. I mean, he's just somehow created this, um, identity and celebrity, uh, you know, which I, it's not undeserved or, you know, for, for insufficient reasons, but it's, it's remarkable the way in which he has moved people. Um, you know, so he comes from this background of being a nurseryman, a plants man, a plants man, and, uh, and having, um, and, and, and the Dutch tradition of garden design, um, and, and then also this kind of German tradition of, of native North American plants, grasses. I mean, I think that, that was all coming out of Germany at, at when he was sort of, and then he would go, I mean, he's very much like in that plant hunter mold. He would go on trips to Slovenia or China, you know, and bringing stuff back for his nursery. And, uh, but it was really, um, you know, I, I think the success of the nursery because of having these really interesting plants um, and unusual plants that weren't typically thought of as garden plants at that time in particular, uh, opened enough opportunities for him to do some, some design work um, that, and it was, I think the first project was a, a, a public, the first public space that he did was for a, a park in Sweden. And, um, and I, I think that was really well received, but I think also um, probably inspired him to think more about public space. But it, and then and then he, and then the actual storyline is that he um, was invited, just commissioned. I mean, it wasn't a competition, but he was commissioned to do a garden for the uh, the Battery Gardens in the very southern tip of Manhattan. Um, and, and specifically after 9-11, it was meant to be a, a, a gardens of remembrance, they're called. And, um, but the people who ran the organization, the kind of um, uh, public-private partnership organization that supported the Battery Garden were just, you know, they just happened to be really clued in and really knew, you know, this, this probably very obscure at that point, um, European designer who was doing some interesting work. And so I think that was pretty enlightened. And then it just so happened it was because of there was a, the Hurricane Sandy came in. I mean, the, the actual work on the battery got postponed or delayed because the site was flooded and could, he couldn't actually do the planting there for a while. And then in the interim, the Lurie Garden happened. He was, that was a comp competition. He won the competition there. And then the High Line happened immediately after that. And those two projects are just, you know, those really blew up and, the High Line, because it's such an amazing thing, in addition to the gardens, the Lurie Garden is very much about the garden, obviously, but um, those two, those two things were just, you know, they just attracted so much attention and maybe being in America or whatever, but, you know, from there, then he's, he's really off and running. And I think also, at the, kind of, at that point, he's really thinking about only doing public spaces, if he can. I mean, he still does private commissions here and there, but he really likes to look for those opportunities to do big public gardens like he's doing in Detroit now. I mean, this incredible project there. So, um, uh, and 
yeah and he just it just like you know the the star continues to rise it's incredible i mean there was an article i remember when i was finishing the film in the editing and there was an article in the toronto newspaper and it was just somebody saying like you know is the aldolf inspired garden trend over or maybe have even been saying it is over or something. but i read it and i just thought oh this is gonna be great like i'm gonna finish this movie and he's gonna be yesterday's news or something and of course that is not that didn't great. happen <laughs> that didn't happen um and yeah he's busier than ever and doing bigger projects than ever and and um uh yeah and he's not he's very dutch i'll say that like he is as dutch as they come in terms of nationality i mean just everything that that in in uh in in inherently captures hopefully but yeah he's just he's a character for sure in that regard well, we have just a few more questions. Can you hang with us about a yeah. couple more minutes? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, another viewer asked, how long did it take to shoot the film? Yeah, it was um, it was basically two years of shooting. I mean, I, I once I had the idea that it would be structured by seasons, um, I shot in every season for a year and then then I went back to for basically another round of a year of seasons because then I was really thinking like, well, you know, what can I, what, what sort of storylines can I tailor to each season? You know, what, then it became more about trying to get him to talk about certain aspects of his work or his life, but in specific seasons, you know, it just felt like, oh, if in the middle of winter he's talking about his childhood, that would be nicer. So it was more, um, more kind of directed approach at that point but it was yeah two years of shooting and then another two and a half years of editing or whatever you know they take a while to come together so <clears throat> I can tell this individual also really loved your film and asked now that you have done a landscape film quote unquote would you consider another landscape based documentary or garden based documentary uh yes I would love to and um and sadly, you know, I mean, I think there were, I, I, it took a while to think about other projects or find things that might be interesting. And then a couple came up and I was sort of really excited to get started on them. And then, you know, everything came to a screeching halt. Um, there, you know, I was meant, one's in Japan. I was meant to be going to Japan last summer and that didn't happen and still isn't happening. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's yes is the answer, but, you know, hopefully, we can get out of this um, holding pattern and I can get back to it. I mean, it does, you know, like they need to be shot and that's the hard part. It's like finding ways to get out to those spaces. And, um, but absolutely no, I mean, it, it's just, it, he was a great character. I think that's really what made the film become what it is, but just spending all that time in those spaces, whether it's his gardens or just out in the woods with him, I mean, it's just so, you know, really enriching and I gladly spend all my time doing that for sure. So just, we have many more, but I'm just gonna take two more because we're at ACOC. Um, so another viewer asked, unlike a painting which can have a long life and represent the artist beyond the artist's life, do you think that the ephemeral nature of Pete's art makes it even that more precious in your film even more important to record it for posterity? Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice to imagine that it's really a, a good record of something um, and will live on and, and archive, you know, some of these projects specifically, but he, he and his work. Um, and, I, and I, but I, yeah, I love the idea that it's ephemeral, the, the, the gardens themselves, I mean, the design work. And, you know, he talks a lot about how there are some projects that he, I, you know, there were projects early on where I thought, okay, I want to go see this one and this one, but I was just responding to like photographs I'd seen. And, and he would say like, I don't, that's, it's not, I don't think of it as my garden anymore. Like I haven't been back there in years. They haven't maintained it. Like he just, you know, it's no longer his. And I think that's really an interesting part of it that it's not, as, as the person says, it's not a painting that's hung on the wall and stays there um, captured in time, that it is a, an ongoing thing. And and one nice thing was that the, the people at the High Line, um, you know, they were excited about the, the project, my project, because the way in which their 
having to think about like how do they keep the garden and keep it evolving and growing but in the spirit of his original design because as I mean, anybody who's been to the High Line, I don't know how many people have had the chance to be there, but the, the world, the, the, the cityscape around the High Line has changed dramatically. I mean, it's just, it's a victim of its own success in some ways, or just the nature of the, the gentrifying city or whatever it is, but it, it's just incredible. Like it's just a different, and so that's had a real impact on those landscapes and the way plants grow for sure. I mean, there's, it's not cheek and jowl with a lot of glass buildings so that makes very specific impacts on the plants themselves but also it it no longer feels like it did when it was when it was first built it felt like you were on this you know plateau with these long vistas and now it's all very shut in and um you know it's just a different thing so they the, you know even in a constructive way i think it's nice that the film can then be something that future gardeners for the High Line can look back on and try to think about how they how they work with that space going forward I love this question because it was on my list. Yeah. Um, how has the partnership with his wife, Anya, influenced his work? I believe he calls her a big force in the film yeah. or something like that, which I love. No, I mean, she's, she is a remarkable person. I mean, I, one of the great privileges of making the film was that I got to spend all this time with them as a, you know, I was just visiting and staying there at their farmhouse. Um, and you know she's a remarkable host, uh, hostess, and and you know took amazing care of me. And but she also is just is a is in her own way this really big presence. But is just you know how, this is how she is or the way they worked it out. But she's always in kind of the background. And so it was a real struggle to to figure out how to get her in the movie. And you know there were many times where I just would like start shooting and she'd be in the room and she would leave or you know, she just was very aware of what I was doing and not wanting to be in the film with Pete. And, and that whole trip to the, the Arboretum in Belgium. Yes. It was- Like you got totally, her because yeah. she was with these friends or these ladies. Yeah. Like it was <laughs> completely engineered by Pete to say like, oh, she loves this place so much. She won't say no, she'll come. And then she's going to be, you know, she'll be stuck in the car for the hour and a half that we're driving there. And what, so that all was like this, it, and that came late in the process too. And it, that felt like a real triumph that it was just like, yeah, we sort of caught the elusive Anya Aldolf. Um But yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to, so really put your finger on her influence because it's she insists on being in the background but at the same time you know she at the very least like totally supported him while he was trying to figure all this out and get it get his own career started um and she managed the nursery the whole time they had it so you know like there's also things that she did that were just constructively essential to this to the success of his career um, so this is a great question to close on, and I'm sorry for the folks whose questions we didn't get to. Um, what is um, what are you working on right now? Yes. Um, well, as I said, there's a couple of things that I was hoping to be working on that are in some kind of suspended animation. Um, but I am I, I was lucky enough to have a bunch of projects, small projects that were in the editing phase when this whole pandemic thing started. And so I was actually able to keep working because I just could stay home and edit. Um, and then one of those projects happened to be, it's a much, it's a large, another kind of feature length project, but it's actually about um, architects that they are, uh, it's a studio called Low Tech and they build with shipping containers sort of primarily. And um, and they, it's, you know, it's kind of reconnects me back to the architecture films I was doing. But in the one nice thing I think that came out of it and, and worth mentioning maybe in this context, even if people are thinking more about gardens and shipping containers, but they, they actually talk about, they talk about beauty almost in the same way as Pete. I mean, they say things that are just so echo what he says in the end of the film, especially, but this idea of, um, you know, working with materials and working with things that other people don't think of as beautiful and trying to create something beautiful with it. And um, and so hopefully I can get that film finished and hopefully there will be some um, some resonance that may make it appeal to people. But, uh, and then, you know, ideally I'll be 
putting some other garden project together soon. So 